Yes, it's Benny Hill time with Peter Vernon, Jan Waters, Patricia Hayes, the Michael Sam singers, and the BBC Review Orchestra conducted by Malcolm Lockyer. It's also time for the lad himself, Benny Hill. You know, when I listen to the radio, I like to hear a good song. You know, songs like Lay Down Your Arms and Whatever Will Be, Will Be. Songs like that, you know, and I often wonder what sort of atmosphere inspires songwriters to write some of these lovely songs. Well, come on in if you're going to. All right, darling. I'm and gonna... shut that perishing door. All right, flower. I'm gonna, gonna go and start now. I'm gonna start me composing. I had inspiration while I was out the back. <laughs> While I was doing a crossword puzzle, see now, where's me pencil and paper? Oh, then here we are, then. So, fish stick, I did debutante. How are you gonna make that noise all day? With your loveliness divine. Why don't you go out, get a proper job? I'm in heaven when I listen. You're nothing but a layabout. To your voice like sparkling wine. <laughs> Miss Dick, I be debutant. Now then, where's all the beer gone? I suppose you've had it all. I oh, know, here it is. Well, you haven't left much, have you? As you toy with your champagne <laughs> and the fragrance of your perfume. Here, here, son, it's burning. I can't smell anything. Well, I can. Oh, poo. <laughs> Oh, look, you've gone and left the iron on. You've gone and burnt hole in me only shirt now. Well, I can't see as it matters as you never wear it. <laughs> Why don't you put some clothes on, eh? You ain't going out your pyjamas for a fortnight. Well, no one don't ever come here, do they? Then what you got your hat on for? Uh? Well, you never know, they might. <laughs> now, shut up, I'm composing. Nights in Paris. When the lights are low. You haven't had a shave for a week. I loved you so. And I can't remember when you last had a bath. Years ago. <laughs> Here, where's my dishcloth? Here, hang on, hang on. I knew it. Yes, you're sitting on it again. Oh, I will smother you with mink and sables. I'll smother you with mink and sables. Oh, I wish you would stop that horrible row. I'll smother you. You what? With mink and sables. <laughs> because I know your worth on our paradise on earth. There, I've finished it now. About time and all. Well, you better hop on your scooter and take it over to him. And see if you can get a dollar out of him on account, will you? Then you can get a quarter light ale on the way home. Oh, all right. Uh, where's it got to go? Well, same as always, that place in Acne. Here, yeah, i got the address on envelope somewhere. Here it is. Now, go on, get on off out of it. Yes, but who've I got to give it to? The same bloke as you always give it to. Billy Foury. Go on, get on. <laughs> summer when the skies are blue and the trees are green and eager fresh-faced lads whisk their apple cheek glasses off to the country for a picnic and Harry Hill and Lofty Vernon are no exception cool it ain't half smashing Harry just you and me and the old motorboat whizzing down the old country lanes together it's exhilarating that's what it is exhilarating yeah it's all right isn't it you don't think we're going too fast do you of course not but I'll slow down if you like. No, it's OK, only the pillion's a bit hard, isn't it? I don't think it's a very good idea you make me sit here with my arms folded. I mean, I feel sort of insecure. Because if I could put my arms round you, I could get older, something, couldn't I? <laughs> and I'd feel a bit safer. Yes, I know you would, but I wouldn't. So you keep your arms to yourself. Well, you might have picked a smoother road. I mean, this one's all lumps and bumps and potholes. Well, I don't know what you're worried about. You've got your crash helmet on your head. It ain't me head that hurts. <laughs> well, we'll soon be there. I wonder what Lofty's bringing for the picnic. Yeah, whatever it is, I'm having mine standing up. Oh, look. 
This must be it by that pond. Oh, yeah, yeah, this'll be it, yeah. Ooh, looks lovely. Don't know how I feel nice having grass under your feet. It's sort of rural. Well, help me off, then. Oh, sorry. <laughs> hey, Lofty's a bit late, isn't he? Yeah. Well, I thought he'd be here already. He left the same time as you, didn't he? Oh, he left half hour for me. Well, he only had to pick up my girlfriend. That shouldn't take long. Here, uh, who'd you ask after all? Well, you know that Avril? What, Avril a windmill? Cool, not half. <laughs> well, I asked her. Good. Yeah, but she couldn't come. Oh. <laughs> so I asked Edie Grimthorpe. And she could come. <laughs> yes. She always can. <laughs> oh, blimey, what do we have to have her for? Edie Grimthorpe's got a very nice nature. A face like hers, she needs to have, doesn't she? <laughs> Is he picking her up at her home or at the slaughterhouse? <laughs> She'll probably go home and change into something very smart. Well, thank heaven for that. Don't want her turning up in them rubber apron and them thigh boots again, do we? Oh, uh, she'll probably turn up in slacks. Yeah, and I know they won't be, will they? <laughs> Follow her down the street wearing slacks. It's like watching two little boys fighting underneath a blanket. Well, it's time they was here anyway. Look, here they come now, then. Hey, hello, Lottie. Hello, Edie. Hello, Harry. Hello, Frida. Hello, you two. Hello. <laughs> nice ride in, Lottie. All right, but I ain't half tired. How about you, Edie? It was most uncomfortable. Them footrests kept going up and down. <laughs> yes, I tried to stop them, but they was too strong for me. Blimey, I mean, no wonder Lockley's tied up. Pedals, love. You're supposed to pedal. Oh, well, if I'd known I was expected to work, I could have stopped at home and helped me mum chop the wood. With a face like that, you wouldn't need to chop the wood, yet. <laughs> now, where's all the grub then, Lockley? Oh, it's in the bag at the back. What, you mean she's at it all? <laughs> Harry. She'll hear you. There it is. It's all in this cake tin. Look, it's bread, corned beef, margarine, fruit cake, and chips. <laughs> One on top of the other. It looks like a guard's supper. Hello, here. What's that then? Oh, you're not having that, Harry. That's mine. Well, what is it? Oh, it's me afters from dinner. I saved it. It's an individual fruit pie. And it's mine. You're not having it because it's mine. Ah, oh, go on, Lottie. Let's have a bit of your individual fruit pie. <laughs> you know I like individual fruit pie. No, it's mine. Besides, we ain't touching any of it till four o'clock. Look, when you two old women are finished gossiping, perhaps we can start having a bit of fun. A bit of fun? Yeah. You know, like hide and seek. <laughs> hide and seek? Yeah. Frida can stay in mind the place. I'll go and hide, and you two lads got to try and find me. And the one who finds me can have a kiss. <laughs> Big deal! <laughs> and if you can't find me, I'll be behind that haystack. <laughs> no, no, listen, let's pair off. Look, two go and hide, and two try and find them. Yes, all right. We'll go first. Come on, then, Harry. Here, yeah, now, wait a minute. I thought you was Lofty's girlfriend. Oh, don't be so unselfish. Come on. <laughs> Live a little. Well, I'm all right, then. OK, well, off we go, then. And look, you two, you count up to 1,000, and then you come after us. <laughs> a thousand? But it'll be dark before they find us. I oh, know. <laughs> look, you count up to 20. Quick. Come on, then, Harry. Well, off you go, then. One, One, two, two three, four, five. Here I know, Harry. Let's cut across this field to the woods. Yeah, all right then. Cool, look at them. What? Them on the ground. Do you think they're mushrooms or toadstools? Eat them and find out. <laughs> and then I'll die, and then you never see me again. I know. Oh, look at that tall tree. It's ever so tall. I know, I can see it. Oh, look at that cow. It's a brown one. I know, I can see it. Oh, look. Oh, look, Harry. Oh, look. I know, I know, I can see it. I say, let's hide behind that bush. Yeah, all right, then. But 
we'll have to be ever so quiet, cos otherwise they'll hear us. We don't want Lofty to find us, do we? What, Lofty? <laughs> oh, Lofty won't find us. Keep your voice down. <laughs> Keep your voice quiet. It may be ours before they find us. Oh, aren't them wildflowers lovely? Sometimes I feel like a wildflower. <laughs> like a little flower growing wilder and wilder. That's what I am. I'm a little wild flower. Yeah, but I mean, you're with Lofty, ain't you? I mean, you're Lofty's girlfriend. I mean, it wouldn't be fair, would it? It wouldn't be fair to Lofty. Oh, we found you. Oh, so you have Lofty. Uh, Lofty. I wonder how you've done that, then. Well, we could hear you talking. I know, I told you to keep your voice down, didn't I? <laughs> well, now, look, you and Edie go and hide, and Frida and I will go back and count up to 20, and then we'll come and find you, see? Oh, all right, then. Hey, come on, Lofty. I'll tell you what we'll do. We are back at camp, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> just, just the two of us. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I start counting? No. Well, aren't you interested in playing hide and seek then? No. You're more interested in something else, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. You got that look in your eye. Well, I'm only a helpless girl. I can't stop you. Well, now you've got your arm round me, what are you going to do? I'm going to lift you off that picnic hamper and have Lofty's individual fruit pie. I love them individual fruit pies, I do. Oh, Harry! We present We Want to Know, an inquiry into matters of everyday interest. This week, the arts and their function in modern society. Well, I'm speaking now to the celebrated portrait painter and Britain's foremost authority on modern art, he says. Mr. Fred Scuttle. Mr. Fred Toulouse Van Gogh Scuttle, if you don't mind. Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Mr. Scuttle, you've been quoted as saying there are two distinct schools of modern art. That is quite so, sir. Well, could you tell us what they are? Yes, sir, I could. <laughs> oh, <then. laughs> Would you? Oh, now, yes, of course, indeed, sir. Well, you see, sir, on the one hand are the conformists, or as we in the trade call them, the with it school, and on the other hand are the non-conformists, the novelly vaggy school, sir, <laughs> to whom we refer to as being way out. I see, and which would you describe yourself as? Way out, sir. <laughs> now, these schools of art, the with its and the way outs, do they apply to the old masters? Oh, indeed, sir, yes. I mean, take, for example, Rubens, sir. You see, now, Rubens, he painted all those well-rounded, unclad female models. Ah, he was way out. No, sir, he wasn't. <laughs> Some of his models was, but not him, <laughs> sir. <laughs> but how would he compare with the other old masters? Let's take, for example, Rembrandt. All right, sir, Rembrandt. Johann Sebastian Rembrandt. <laughs> well, then, sir... You see, Sir Rubens, he spent all his time painting those nude female models, sir, because he was a purist, he was a figurist, he was a dirty old man. <laughs> now then, Sir Rembrandt, he could have done the very same thing, but he preferred painting old men with beards. What would you call him? A twit. <laughs> but of course, no two artists think alike, do Oh, they? no, so they have their own style, sir, their own ways. Their own little peccadilloes? Beg your pardon, sir? I said artists have their own little peccadilloes. More than likely, sir, yeah. <laughs> but I'd love to go on talking to you, sir, but I'm afraid I have to go home and get on with my painting. Oh, I see. What is it you're going to paint this time? A beautiful landscape? Some exquisite elfin-featured girl? No, sir, the door of our shed. It's got a touch of woodworm. I'm gonna... <laughs> I'm gonna bung a dollop of creosote on it, sir. So Ta-da! <laughs> Well, and so to the written word, for we have with us a writer. May I introduce Mr. Mervyn Cruddy? Hello. <laughs> Mr. Cruddy, when is your next work going to be published? Next Sunday. Sunday? Well, isn't that an odd day to publish? Not for a Sunday newspaper, it's not. <laughs> I see, you write for a Sunday newspaper. Yes, the Sunday Ben. The paper that faces facts and names names. <laughs> Who is your editor? I'd rather not say. <laughs> Well, then, tell us, if you would, what your next piece is about. It is a show business expose. It's entitled The BBC, Startling Disclosures. 
Vase probe at Eliolian Hall. <laughs> and it will cover the first four pages. Mm. Well, I hope it's authentic. Well, if it's not, I shall put a tiny little retraction on the back page next week. <laughs> May I continue? Please do. All London is aghast at the scandal which has rocked the BBC. All aghast? Look, you must stick to the truth, you know. I'm quite well informed, and I've never even heard of it. I should be very careful if I was you, mate. Otherwise, next week on the front page, I shall deny those wicked rumours that are going around about how you got this job with the BBC. Well, there are no rumours going round. It can be arranged, you know. <laughs> I could do a nice little piece. Is there any truth in the rumour that Peter Vernon is carrying on with an announcer's wife in big letters? And little tiny letters underneath, we say no. <laughs> But I don't even know any announcer's wives. I know, that's what I'm saying, but I wouldn't envy you your own life after that little lot. <laughs> your missus wouldn't like it, would she? You'd have no cocoa for a fortnight. <laughs> May I continue? By all means. Thank you. Vice Ring discovered at the BBC by our special co-respondent. <laughs> that's me. I little knew when I entered the portholes of the alien all of the corruption and degradation and vice I was to uncover. My suspicions were first aroused when the shifty-eyed doorman tried to bar my way. You can't come in here without an appointment, he said. An appointment for what, I wondered. <laughs> I bounded quickly up the old oaken staircase and made my way along strangely quiet passages. A sense of evil lurked everywhere. <laughs> I heard strange noises emanating from one of the rooms. I quickly burst in. In the room were several men in various stages of undress. Really? Well, two of them had their ties off. <laughs> the man who seemed to be in charge of this gathering gave his name as Malcolm Lockyer. <laughs> now, there's a likely name, isn't it? Also in the room were two women. One, an attractive blonde, upon being questioned, said she was a cellist. Asked where her cello was, she blushed crimson and said, in a faltering voice, it hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> the other woman, an attractive redhead, insisted that she played the oboe. And to back up her statement, produced what looked like an oboe, but could also have been and closely resembled a Chinese opium pipe. <laughs> Struggling to hide my mounting disgust at this loathsome sight, I made for the door, only to bump into an attractive brunette who said she was a secretary. She carried with her what she said was a script for midday music hall, but could so easily have been a phonographic literature. <laughs> yes, a lot of questions need answering up at the BBC. <laughs> Well, now to someone a little more friendly, I hope, Mr. Roland Plaster. Now, Mr. Plaster, I believe that poetry plays a very important part in your life. Yes, I even like to talk in rhyme. In fact, I do it all the time. <laughs> very interesting. And to all the people listening in, I'd like to say good evening, evening in. <laughs> you see. Now, you come from Wiltshire, is that right? Frynmouth is from where I hail. I came here today by rail. <laughs> Did you have a nice journey? There was no corridor on the train. I shall not make that trip again. <laughs> yes, well, now, I gather that your literary talent was discovered while you were still at school. Who first noticed this? It was the caretaker, Mr Hall. He saw the writing on the wall. <laughs> Yes. Well, I understand that you're now going to give us one of your poems, which I believe has been set to music. I'll never know. You'll never know what? Oh, Mr Vernon, you've got me wrong. I'll never know is the name of the song. Oh. <laughs> I'll never know why a horse grazing in a field all day should feel so hard to sit upon when he's so full of hay. I'll never know how a rose can look so sweet and pure and hold its head up high when it's standing in manure. I'll never know. never know why I wait for a bus till I'm frozen to the bone. Then two turn up together 
Are they scared to come alone? I'll never know if it's true When they say that fish can fly Though the one I had for tea today Was really rather high I'll never know, never know, never know was Benny Hill time with the BBC Review Orchestra conducted by Malcolm Lockyer, the Michael Sam Singers, Peter Vernon, Jan Waters and Patricia Hayes. Benny Hill time was written by Benny Hill and produced by John Brown.